Emily and I have been playing with once. Uh, Cheryl Poiwazance uh, and I have played with it two or three times where we just kind of expose an open dialogue around notions of understanding more deeply indigenous practices in our, in our education. So, yeah, so this is really an unscripted conversation we're about to have. Um, and we've done it once before, but who knows where it'll take us. We don't know. <laughs> um, so we're going to start today with um, talking about this acknowledgement of treaty territory. Thank you very much, Shauna, for the opening and for introducing uh, the talk on Treaty 4 lands and, of course, the ancestral lands of several Indigenous nations. Um, and we like to unpack this because we are in this pursuit of how do we indigenize and are we indigenizing things in a good way or could we be doing it in a more constructive way we were talking about treaty acknowledgments and whether they are symbolic whether they become tokenistic if we just throw it out here we're here on treaty four lands so we're going to unpack this a little bit um I am from Treaty 1 territory. I grew up there, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I am a member of the Métis Nation. Um, in Manitoba, we have several indigenous nations that call Treaty 1 their ancestral or homeland. So we have the Cree Nation, we have the Anishinaabe Nation, also ca called the Ojibwe, very um, close cousins and allies with the Soto Nation here. and. Uh, Further to Treaty 1, further to the west, we have the Dakota Nation, and to the north, we have the Oji Cree and the Dene Nations. Um, so one of the things that I have learned upon moving here um, two years ago is some of the different and similar cultural practices that the Cree, Soto, and Assiniboine nations in this territory practice. Um, it's been a steep learning curve for me and there is much more for me to learn but um, but I really take that as an opportunity to expand my own knowledge as a Métis person and this concept of Indigenous worldview or Indigenous knowledge systems um, and so I like to challenge other people to sort of expand their own horizons in this way. Hmm. And if you think you're on a learning um, I'm on a very deep, steep, steep learning curve. I come from the West Coast, unceded territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil And I arrived here three and a bit years ago. And I feel that I am in a place that I don't think uh, I occupy alone in terms of that fear of stepping into understanding more about uh, indigenous practices and being sensitive to that without being paralyzed with my own fear. And I think I also represent, I'm in teacher education, and I think I also represent a, a good portion of our students who also feel somewhat paralyzed. So I thought, well, the best thing about parenting and teaching is modeling. And so I thought, well, I will just model with my students and now here with my colleagues um, how, what it feels like to sort of strip bare and ask questions. And so this is why this is called uh, With a Baby's Mind, is because I, I feel like what babies do is they learn how to talk, they learn how to walk by falling, by getting back up again. They have an amazing resilience and we, we lose that when we when we move into adulthood. And we know what it feels like when we try to learn a new language and, and feel terrible when we get words wrong and grammatical structures wrong. And I feel that I'm in a, in a place of a baby where I need to be courageous and resilient in terms of how I ask questions and draw from the knowledge of Emily, <laughs> our elders in residence, um, our elders in the community, our knowledge keepers. So I um, have done this a few times where I just open up some of my practices that I have introduced in my classroom and I ask, what do you think? <laughs> and we have a kind of critical dialogue around this. 
So the first thing that I, I feel the most uncomfortable with, Emily, is um, this, this term, indigenization. And I feel that it is a kind of uh, a fast branding. And all too often, uh, we will marshal our work uh, often to a place of, well, we've covered that now. Check the box. And so there is something around that fast sweep and, and uh, that can move easily into tokenism. And so I, I've been trying to avoid even the word indigenization and trying to use more um, understanding indigenous practices or indigenous sensibilities. Or what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, being that this is unscripted, let me have a moment to think about that. That's a big, that's a big thing. So in this work of indigenization, um, in my previous life, I worked more around decolonization. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's been a shift moving into a world of indigenization. I've had to learn some different practices and, um, and I think quite a bit about the distinction between decolonization and indigenization. And, um, and I listen a lot to what people have to say about that because it's very controversial for many people, this term. Um, and I learn a lot from uh, different indigenous communities that I sort of circle in and out of um, because, of course, some of the things that I hear are, well, I'm indigenous, how are you going to indigenize me, which is a very good point. Um, but then we also have to think about whether or not you as um, a non-indigenous settler person, you know, how do you take up indigenization? How do you, um, you know, uh, uh, there's that term thinking cap. So how do you take on a cap and just apply this totally different worldview to what you're doing? Um, and it's a big challenge. And so uh, I think that we need to make room for people who are doing decolonial work instead of indigenization um, and make room to make mistakes in this, if that makes sense. Um, not in terms of uh, being okay with people presenting indigenous worldview as authentic when they're not authentic, but knowing that a lot of people have been asked to take this up that maybe um, don't have a life of thinking about these things under their belt to, to be working from. Yeah, the other thing that I'm thinking about is that idea of uh, rarifying the process or making the process an integrated, everyday kind of thinking. And so I like when you say the thinking cap because I, I feel like um, I, I'm going to go through a few of the things that I've done in my class and sort of get a sense of what Emily thinks of that and then we're going to open it up to you. Um, and we're modeling what I have done in my classes where the students see me kind of like uncomfortable and squirming around trying to find the language and to articulate my stance but after a while when they see that I could do it <laughs> and I'm, I'm fine then they actually start to muster up some courage to actually begin the discussion in their own authentic way. So um, I, I do feel that in some cases um, I feel like I need as an instructor to think more about the tenets of um, indigenous sensibilities, experiential, holistic, um, uh, place-based, uh, uh, reciprocity, um, compassion. These are some things that actually if I start to title out some of the tenets of the work, um, it makes me feel less fearful. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I can start to feel how I can permeate a lot of the work I do in the classroom, every class, and not we're going to take October 24th to do Indigenous education. Yeah, well I definitely think it's important to tease it through the whole semester, the whole course, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of um, compartmentalizing it in one day one course, um, and just in terms of 
you're, what you're really sharing with us is your vulnerability through this process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned from Catherine through this process is my being okay with sharing and to thinking about my own vulnerabilities through this. So when Catherine called me up um, and said, would you like to do this with me? We didn't know each other. We, it was a couple of days away. Uh, and so I thought, I'm just gonna dive in. But I was tentative because she said, what I like to do is present these artifacts. And I would like you to comment on how I use these artifacts to indigenize my teaching. And because I had come from a world of working in museums, I immediately <clears throat> had, had these preconceived notions of what she was talking about with artifacts. And in the museum world, we don't use the word artifact. When we're doing decolonized curation, um, we use the word sacred bundles because, of course, our objects, our, our living, our, our pipes, these things that are housed within museums um, are alive and they require water and tobacco and they require their languages to be spoken to them and they require being used within um, in ceremony to stay alive because they have a spirit. So I immediately was sort of like, what am I getting into? But I'm going to jump in. And then so she shows up for our first thing and she pulls out her artifacts and I said, oh, yes, those are artifacts, <laughs> right? And so what I started to think about was just how we, how I, rather, assume um, that we cannot use these Western-based terms with these Western-based connotations for things and we need to indigenize them when really, I don't think we could make an argument that this is not an artifact. This is not a sacred bundle. This does not hold within it our uh, knowledge and it does not need to be prayed over or used in prayer or ceremony. So it was a big learning, uh, a, a lesson for me to really know when to react and think through Western lens and an indigenous lens. Yeah. Yes, and I think that that's also part of the fear base of the ontologies. You know, how what languages we use and attach to certain meanings, and and the fear around that. Um, I I'm going to go on a little bit to talk, and because you referred to these, it would be good to talk yeah. a little bit about them. Let's jump in. So. Um, here are some of the points of what uh, we're going to cover, and these are some of the, and I'll do it briefly, but they're, they're more or less kind of springboards so that we can carry on in a deeper conversation. So these are all different events or uh, exercises that I have done in my classes, and I'll go through each of them. So it, it is uh, quite common to see this in our faculty, smudging takes place here. It's really quite common to walk the halls and and to, um, to be with the aroma of the smudging taking place in either our, our decolonized uh, counseling space or other offices where our elders are in residence. And in that way, I, I, I love that actually. I really, th that is actually in material talking about that permeability of, of thinking about uh, indigenous understandings. I love that it's in the air, it's, it surrounds us. These, these pictures are here and I feel, or these posters that, that say smudging takes place here. So I feel that at, in our faculty that there is a real true commitment to this idea of um, making it uh, all the time, everywhere. This is Joseph Natabo, and he was our, uh, what he called, emerging elder in residence last year. Um, many of you probably know him. He's also a practicing artist in this province and works across the country. Um, he came into my class, and I was wildly nervous about it because it was the first elder that I had brought into class. And I did so much research with Shauna, uh, Shaunine Pete around tobacco and offering and how to wrap it and what to say and I, it, I was so obsessed with this that I even wrote a script for it which you know big font and on the table and and I, I remember uh, intersecting with Lee uh, who's not with the, in, in our faculty anymore and I said Lee what should I do like wh which hand do I give him the tobacco with and he, you know, I mean I was so worried and he said you give it to him from your heart. <coughs> yeah. 
bathroom. <laughs> so um, I warned the students that I would be doing this. I said that I was nervous about it, that I wanted to do it right. Um, and so I gave, uh, I gave uh, Joseph the tobacco. I said, how did I do in front of the students? And he said, well, you could have used a Cree word in there. And I said, okay, great, which Cree word? And if you know Joseph, he often, he's very kind of um, adamant around teaching people Cree, even if it's only a few words for a meeting. So this was, this was the word that we all learned and said over and over again. Um, Elma Portress is our, our current elder in residence and also uh, was with us last year. And this is also uh, on her door. There's room, come in. So there's, this is one way that I think is really concrete and beautiful that, um, that our students begin to take up the language and begin to put that into space as uncomfortable as it is to find the pronunciation. So what happened with Joseph is that, sorry, I'll just go back here, um, is that I assigned homework for the students, come with, you know, at least seven questions or something. And we all sat on the floor and Joseph talked and he was very slow and he was very soft. And my students, I could see in their bodies that they started to get really agitated. They were, and it kind of escalated to a point where they were like, this is not a clear trajectory, this is circuitous, what is the point? I don't get the outcome of this class. And then slowly I could see them starting to kind of slow down a little bit. And then they started to soften in their body. I'm just <laughs> showing you what they did. And then they started to actually lean against the walls, and some of them had heavy heads, you know, and I thought, oh, please don't fall asleep in this class. And then when it came to close to the end, when I wanted them to pull out their homework for their questions, I couldn't bring myself to ask it, because I understood that they were in another state. And this is, a, this is a hugely important for me and for my students to understand that when we're working, with an elder, with a knowledge keeper, that there's a, another kind of tempo, and there's another kind of membrane of information that's imparted. And it takes us to a, another kind of state, a, a, a different kind of embodied state. And it was far, far away from the homework that, <laughs> that was supposed to be pulled out. They were grateful, and they came up to me after <coughs> class and said, now I really need a nap. And, you know, but, I thought it was uh, actually um, so important to learn that, that I wrote an article with um, consultation with Joseph around that whole notion of entering another state, not just a comprehension. Did you want to talk a little bit or respond to that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think it's funny. So I've heard this story before because we've done this once before, and I think it's very funny that Catherine was so worried and created this script um, because one of the biggest requests that comes to me is can we meet so I can talk to you about giving tobacco and writing a script to ask an elder something um, it's it's something that weighs on our minds um, as we learn these new protocols or seek to access this knowledge um, and I always say you know just speak from the heart that's the most important thing uh, because all knowledge keepers are going to have their own teachings around tobacco and how to ask for knowledge. So I work with a Métis knowledge keeper who doesn't want tobacco given to her because that's not her teaching. Um, and different knowledge keepers, again, just have different expectations. And the greatest thing about that is that they'll tell you if you ask them your ex what your expectation is, they will share that with you, and they will show you how to do it properly according to their teachings. Uh, and the script is adorable. <laughs> it is, it just is. And I, I help people write these things all the time, but I always, as they leave, say, but please remember that talking from your heart is probably the most important thing here, and if you do that, you can't get it wrong. But if you step out of line in any way, a knowledge keeper is going to gently correct you back onto the proper pathway. Um, yeah, so, so just never be afraid 
to ask those things. Um, and it is so important to bring knowledge keepers into classrooms. You could ask me as the executive lead to come and talk about something, but I am not a knowledge keeper and I'm not on that path and have very limited teachings that have been shared with me over the years by elders. While I have been a part of an indigenous community my whole life and known elders, I don't have this uh, repository of teaching and knowledge and I, um, and, and so you wouldn't get from me what you would get from a knowledge keeper. But there's also sometimes situations where knowledge keepers aren't maybe the most appropriate or ideal person to invite into your classroom, especially if it's um, perhaps something that might touch them personally, if they're a residential school survivor or um, have lost family members due to certain circumstances. So to invite them in to talk about youth suicide or um, missing and murdered indigenous women is not always the most appropriate and so it's just very good I think to ask questions to ensure that you're bringing in the right person to talk about uh, perhaps language with Joseph right. um, or um, someone who's really well versed in uh, teachings around teepees or what have you because all knowledge keepers of course have their own <coughs> gifts that they're bringing with them and uh, these gifts can't, are not universal gifts, right? Um, so, so we all bring different things. It's important to be aware of that. And I remember when uh, Joseph came in, he said, Catherine has asked me to come in. I know this is a dance class. I did my research. I talked to my mom, my mother. <laughs> and I thought this was quite wonderful. My mother is a beautiful dancer, he said. And, and I thought this was also modeling something amazing to, to remind our students that we need to go back to our ancestry in terms of how we're teaching and as, as close as those that we share our home with, you know, in terms of important information and that was beautifully respectful. So I, I went on to um, have Elma come into the class the following term. I was prepared this time to watch my students start to go like this. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to get so nervous about that. I know that this is, this is okay. And so at the end, uh, when Elma left, I said, I want you to write a letter to Elma. Not, I won't necessarily give it to her, but I want you to think that you're writing a letter to Elma. And tell me what was challenging and what, and what happened to you in this talk. I was inviting them to talk about what they thought about the talk, but also to tap into that state that they were moving into. And so they brought the letter back, and then I said, okay, so now what I want you to do is I want you to um, extract the key words from that letter and create a poem. So they did that. And then I said, now what I want you to do is from that, I want you to find an image that matches the poem. And so in the end, what happened is that um, each student came with an image and a poem. And it ended up in a, a booklet that I presented to Elma. So she didn't get the letter. She got the poem and the image. So there was a kind of a, a, a poetic rendering or a distillation from it that she received. And uh, she was just so touched. She held it to her heart and said she was going to take it back to the reserve to, and share it with her people and that she was fiercely proud of um, the kind of impact she had made. So that was interesting for me to think about how a response could be channeled into another kind of creative expression and move into a deeper understanding of the impact. Which I. I really like this because what I've learned from this is how do we indigenize our teaching when we're in a Western classroom and we're using these Western-based um, teaching tools? And this is something that I'm dealing with right now as I create a new course. And so I'm working with a friend. Hi, sorry, I see a hand. I, I really apologize. Can I ask a question? Can I interrupt you now or would you want me to wait till later? <laughs> and it's only because you're because of the term indigenized or indigenizing, and you haven't actually given us a definition of what you actually, oh. what does it mean to indigenize or what is indigenous to you? Yeah. To you. 
coming that you're coming from different backgrounds uh, and sure. different ethnicities. So I'm just trying to figure out when you talk about indigenizing yeah. a I space. I think it's very fair. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's no script here, so yeah, absolutely so. jump in. Um, okay, well, it's a good question because um, indigenization is going to mean different things to both of us as different individuals. As the lead of indigenization for the university, I have a definition that I use. I talk about indigenization being something that is about transforming um, university space, decision making, learning, and research from a perspective of indigenous worldviews. Um, my elders, long before I even came to Regina, this was a conversation happening in Winnipeg. What's the difference between decolonization and indigenization? So from uh, the elders I was working with, I learned that decolonization is a response, an undoing of colonization, whereas indigenization is completely se separate from that process of colonialism. And so it is about those worldviews that are um, held intact through our language, through our cultural practices, through um, the lessons and knowledge held within our land that we continue to practice and express. So it does not have a relationship to colonialism. Um, and so when we bring that into university, it can transform university in various ways. It can bring um, a new source of knowledge. And of course, universities are uh, about gathering, disseminating knowledge, teaching, as well as other things. So um, that is, from an institutional perspective, how I understand indigenization. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> well, worldview is very important in, in that whole, what, what you just talked about. I don't really know. I, I started the talk today saying that I don't really like that term at all, actually. I don't, I, I try very hard to, to move away from that and just to come to a place of um, understanding the sensibilities of where I am and that um, that I am living on Treaty 4 territory and I need to understand what that means and I'm on a steep learning curve still and you, you can feel my sort of baby steps in trying to understand and move into a place where I feel more confident in my language and my formulation of worldview and so my baby steps are linking with people who can help me in that journey. And that's Joseph, that's Elma, that's Emily, that's Cheryl. And, and then uh, learning that in a way that's uh, committed to a vulnerability and uh, uh, fierce reflectivity. Um, and so that's why in this project, it's really important for me that the students just don't go, oh, Elma came into our class last week. But they sit with it and they go through iteration and iteration of their reflective process on that so that it, it begins to move deeper into their own thought process and positioning around this. Yeah, that, that's the best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it was important to ask that as you were Yes, no, I think so terms. too. And to, to keep asking it, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, I, in terms of time, should I skip over this, or what do you think I should do? And go to those guys, or? Uh, how much time do we have? We're at 12.30. Um, well, since we've referenced these, mm -hmm. let's talk okay. five minutes. All right, let's okay. do that. Okay. So uh, Sharon Burns, who is the, uh, she was the arts ed and treaty advisor in North Battleford Prairie Sky School District. Now she's the, the treaty education advisor in that area. And she approached me to do a project whereby we would access the stories of the uh, mass hanging, the last Canadian mass hanging in North Battleford. And these are, horrendous stories and how could we bring these stories into uh, a, some respectful way of understanding this through education. So we gathered teachers from that district, elders, um, advisors, myself and some of my students and um, t 
together, and Joseph was part of this as well, we created a consortium of resources, stories, images. They lived on a shared uh, Google Doc. And uh, um, Ben Ironstan into my class. And we worked together to try and create um, artful ways of uh, understanding those stories and working with those stories. So it was a difficult process. and. Our students are very good at figuring out, well, I think they are, um, how to do the, you know, the water cycle through movement. <laughs> you know, the reenactment of the Canadian Railway in tableaus. But this was a challenge for them. And uh, so it was a careful planning. There were banners of paper on the floor with timelines. Um, there was a lot of work with uh, photo elicitation and figuring out how to kind of uh, crystallize or distill stories into movement. And finally, what came out of it was an assignment where they had to create flashcards for the teachers in North Battleford. So in these flashcards, the teachers have the pool of all the resources. And then in the flashcards, each one of these has a prompter of the story how they could possibly play with the, some of this story or work with these stories, extensions from it, and resources used. Um, and uh, Cheryl was the Indigenous lead at that time, so I, I took them to her and had her look through them as well before they were disseminated to the uh, Sharon Burns and then through to the teachers. So that was that project. Well, and it's an interesting project because Catherine engaged with uh, different Indigenous people and uh, a knowledge keeper, an elder, for this project, um, which is really important. Um, you know the saying, nothing about us without us. So it's, it's great when you bring in the right people for the project. Um, and it's a curious thing when you uh, boil down Indigenous knowledge into paper, and, uh, because then it becomes this static the static tool um, and my uh, from my childhood I, I was taught you know like it's the oral history it's the um, that keeps the stories and the knowledge alive and that's how it ought to be disseminated um, and then it's also a really interesting thing that this is about land right and so North Battleford obviously is not here uh, and so there's this interesting um, collapsing of knowledge of land from North Battleford into this and then a use of this here in, in these lands and how, what gets lost in the translation when it's not in the land that it originates from, um, it's just a, a curious thing. Um, and I was also just thinking as you were talking, you know, as a child I was sort of imagining being on the land with my grandfather and how years, years later, I went and did a PhD in Native Studies and then um, worked in this field of indigenous research methods and learning, um, learning to sort of, looking back and realizing that connection of land to story and language wasn't something I was aware of as a child, but then you go to Native Studies and you open a textbook and you're like, oh, okay, I get it now, right? Um, it's sort of this really strange thing that academia has done by putting it into textbooks, but then also making it this sort of, it universalizes it or um, creates this sort of pan-Indian approach to it. Mm -hmm. So. I guess I sort of also see that wrapped up in this project. Mm -hmm. But that said, the right, from my mind, from my experience of working within Western-based institutions, when you are go about this work of indigenization, you know, you met with the right people. Um, the project came from an indigenous person working on the land uh, who was motivated to create this project. Um, bringing in knowledge keepers. So it's really interesting how it's almost like a first step and then we need to think further and dismantle that um, to make it more authentic. Like there's opportunity to create, to 
to to push the authenticity mm -hmm. further. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I totally hear what you're saying, and I think one of the things that can often bother me with artists working in classrooms <coughs> is that um, the older model is that an artist will come in and then the teacher will kind of learn it and then emulate it in a sort of half-baked way once the artist is gone. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really trying to impart with our teacher and students and also working with artists and teachers in the community is that we work with principals. And that if we can go into a classroom and say, here are some of the um, principles around how to transfer this story into something artful, then it becomes more authentic in the classroom because they then don't have a formula. They just have a certain principle, of how, a framework that they can move into. So I think that that in itself ensures, and it drives my students crazy because it's, it's non-prescriptive, right? And they, they certainly want a paint by number in many ways, you know, and no, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what I want, you know, and so, I, but I think it's really important in this way, and so when you see this and I say flashcard, it probably comes across as something at first. Step one, <laughs> read the story, step two. But I think they are trying to create these uh, prompters, and that's in fact what they were, talking about. Yeah, yeah. But I, I totally hear what you're saying, that we we, uh, we we need to be careful that we're not cornering ourselves into something that feels tidy. Well, and there's ways to sort of further this project, right, by, um, you know, being physically on the land or rewriting it from this specific place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which I'm um, sure Mike could talk about with our, our field trips to, you know, with our students. I'm going to go to the last one. Well, there's some of the flashcards and the resources. Calls to action in a pocket. I started to do something with my graduate students when I was giving them dense texts, and they were like, I can't understand. And then I would give, I'd pull out a quote from the text, and I would assign the text as well for that week, and I'd ask them to put that quote in their pocket and walk around the whole week with it in their pocket. I want to see it come back with coffee stains and wrinkled and you know, probably gone through the wash a few times. But take it out every day, take it out somewhere and look at that quote. And I found that they had a deeper understanding of the text by being reminded of it in a dailyness. And so I transferred that to um, calls, the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. And so I, I photocopy them, and you will all get one today, too. <laughs> and they're small enough. This is from the area of, on education. And then I ask students to put it in their pocket and pull it out every day, at least once a day. Look at where they are in the world, and look at this call, and think about it. And so again, it's that idea of not rarefying the process, but actually embedding it in our feet on the ground as we move through the world. And trying to reinforce that idea that sometimes our, our emotions towards reconciliation can be something that, that comes to us in the most unexpected times. And I love this exercise because um, the calls to, I mean, there's 94 calls to action <laughs> and it's overwhelming. <laughs> um, so how do you move through those calls Having one call and, and becoming sort of uh, intimately aware of, of the call and having it on your body and reading it and thinking about it over the course of week of the week sort of makes you unpack it. But it also sort of puts it deep in that subconsciousness so that maybe as you dream or you're going for a walk or making dinner, something comes to you and you say, that's how I can do it. Um, yeah, and what I also like about this is, it, this is something that I've been thinking about, this activity, because it, it, it moved me uh, when you first shared it with me, and it got me thinking about this divide between decolonization and indigenization, a divide that I'm often thinking about. And it got me thinking about how I think that this is an, an, an exercise of decolonization, in that 
you know, to have some fun with it, to indigenize it, to take it in, in that direction, you could sit with your students and I'm going to borrow um, a cultural practice from the region I come from, which is um, using birch bark to make art. And you could sit with the students and have them take birch bark scripts and write out the call to action. Mm -hmm. And what I like about that is um, I have been told uh, by my elders that when we, when we want knowledge and we create uh, a tobacco tie to get that knowledge, it's important, this process of creating the tobacco tie. We are putting our intentions into it. We are putting our prayers into it. Um, however you interpret that, we are putting a part of ourselves into it. And, um, and that process is extremely important. And, and we're giving all of those intentions to the person that we're seeking that knowledge from. And so I sort of envision uh, this aspect of indigenizing this exercise of, of putting of writing it out on birch bark as um, putting your intention and your thoughts more fully into it um, and then maybe it also becomes it's a bit more fragile um, it becomes something that you care for a little bit more during your week uh, but then I'm going to now criti critically analyze uh, what I suggested and say you know I I don't know in this territory if using birch bark is a artistic practice, a cultural practice. Um, so maybe I am culturally appropriating something that I grew up doing and uh, misappropriating it, putting it into this place where it does not belong. Maybe it does not fit. Mm -hmm. We would have to seek wiser people than us to figure that out. Well, one of the things that you said about this that I really liked is you said it was carried on the body. And I feel like two out of three of these processes, well, actually also the reflection with Elma, but um, the idea of the students moving into that state and the idea of this piece of paper being on your body and having to get into your pocket, that's a bodily act, right? looking for it, which pocket did I put it in, right? Finding it in the laundry. So there's, for me, I guess, because em embodied understandings are at the heart of what I do, I feel like you've helped me to understand that that's something that's really important for me in this process. And I think it's my authentic sort of um, key, you know, to, to feel like um, I'm, I'm embracing certain tenets of indigenous practices and world views through the body in, in the ways in which I, I'm bringing it to my students. Thank you for that. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> that was good. What, should we open it up yes. to some questions yes, or comments? Yes. 